Thanks so much for joining me today. Before I begin my talk, please can I ask you all if you have questions, um, not to raise your hand, but rather to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end of this talk, I'll try to answer as many of those questions as I can. Okay, so <clears throat> my name is Lindy Thompson. I work for the Endangered Wildlife Trust's Bird of Prey program, and I coordinate vulture conservation and research. Um, yeah, thanks so much for joining me today to talk about vanishing vultures. So here is a quick overview of what we'll talk about today. Firstly, we'll discuss the reasons why vultures are vanishing across Africa. We'll also talk about why vultures are important, why we need to conserve them. I'll go over some of the activities the Endangered Wildlife Trust is doing to help vultures. Then I'll tell you why I think vultures are mind blowing and we'll end off with some of the ways we can help vultures. There are 23 vulture species globally. If we divide those vulture species according to their threat classifications, there are nine vulture species that are critically endangered. There are three vulture species that are endangered, four that are near threatened, and the remaining seven vulture species are classified as least concern. Vultures are currently the most threatened group of birds in the world, and there are many threats to African vulture populations. The main threat is poisoning. Sometimes the poisoning is unintentional. For example, when a farmer uses poison bait to kill jackals on their farm, they might accidentally kill vultures too. Sometimes though, the poisoning is intentional. For example, if someone wants to acquire vulture body parts for use in traditional medicine or muti, or <clears throat> when poachers want to kill vultures, so the birds can't alert rangers to illegal poaching activities. We call this kind of poisoning sentinel poisoning. Vultures are social feeders. If one vulture feeds on a poisoned bait, most likely many other vultures will feed there too. And this is why poisoning is the biggest killer of vultures in Africa. When we come across poisoning scenes like this one, one of the things we need to do is get rid of the poisoned bait and any dead scavengers so that no more wild animals will feed on that poisoned bait and become poisoned themselves. One way to do this is to burn the poisoned bait and any dead animals at the scene. Exposure to lead also poses an important threat to vultures. Sources of lead include mining activities, the petrochemical industry and lead ammunition. There are at least 64 scientific articles on lead poisoning in vultures. The source of lead they most often suggest to be the cause of lead poisoning of vultures is lead ammunition. When an animal is shot, a lead bullet can leave lead fragments throughout the carcass. Shooters often leave the entrails of the carcass behind for scavengers to eat, and this is when vultures might consume small fragments of lead. A study by Lambertucci and colleagues published in 2011 used lead isotope analysis to match the kind of lead found in the feathers of Andean condors with the kind of lead found in ammunition for red deer and wild boar hunting and for hare hunting. Researchers in France used similar methods to link lead poisoning in vultures in the French Pyrenean mountains with lead ammunition. A team of researchers in Spain and Portugal found a similar link between elevated lead levels in griffin vultures and lead-based ammunition. And various studies have used isotope analysis to link the high lead levels in California condors with lead from ammunition. In addition, in addition to in intentional and unintentional poisoning and lead poisoning, other threats to vultures include collisions on power lines and electrocutions on energy infrastructure and collisions with wind turbines. This is a photo of a hooded vulture that was electrocuted close to where I live. Vultures can also be affected by persecution when they are intentionally shot or by human disturbance through outdoor recreational activities near their nest sites. They can be affected by habitat loss and degradation, and they can suffer from reduced food availability. Collectively, these are the main reasons why many vulture populations are declining rapidly across Africa. 
And this is why the EWT's Birds of Prey program is working across Southern Africa on various research and conservation projects to help conserve these important birds. Let's move on to the second section of this talk and discuss why vultures are important. So why are vultures important? Why should we conserve them? Well, firstly, they provide an important ecosystem service for us by cleaning up carcasses free of charge. Secondly, there could be great value to this cleaning service as it's likely to be linked to reduced disease transmission. And thirdly, many African cultures have strong beliefs around vultures. Some researchers have tried to quantify the value of vultures in terms of the cleaning services they provide and their potential to bring ecotourism. This first study looked at the consequences of a massive die-off of vultures in India and Pakistan in the 1990s. As the vultures almost disappeared, feral dogs stepped in to fill the void left by the vultures and the dogs thrived on the food, the carrion, that previously had mostly been eaten by the vultures. Dog numbers increased dramatically and so did the spread of rabies, which was spread by dog bites. The authors estimated the value of the cost um, that was caused by vultures missing throughout the environment at 34 billion US dollars over 14 years. The second study estimated the cleaning services provided by turkey vultures in the Americas at over half a million US dollars per year. These researchers concluded that vultures play a significant role in protecting the health of the environment and in protecting human well-being. This third study estimated the tourism revenue that vultures could add to a nature reserve in Israel at over 1 million US dollars annually. So these are just three studies valuing the services provided by vultures, but they show that vultures do save governments a lot of money in terms of the free cleaning services they provide. But vultures are also worth conserving in their own right. They are majestic birds and the African skies just wouldn't be the same without them. So let's move on to what we at the Endangered Wildlife Trust are doing to help vultures. So I'm based in a small town called Hoodsbreit in the northeast corner of South Africa. The team that I'm part of focuses on birds of prey projects in the Kruger National Park and in the Kruger to Canyons Biosphere region, which spans the Limpopo and Mpumalanga provinces. We also work in some of the private reserves that make up the associated private nature reserves along the western boundary of the Kruger Park. We're very lucky to focus our work on Timbavati Private Nature Reserve, the Luli Nature Reserve, Klesiri Private Nature Reserve, Salati Game Reserve, Wild Rivers Private Nature Reserve, Cleveland Game Reserve, and Blay Ulifant Nature Reserve. We mostly work with hooded and white-backed vultures, which are the two most common tree nesting vulture species in our area. Our work involves a lot of tagging and trapping vultures, taking blood samples for a raptor health study and fitting tracking devices so we can study vulture movements. In Limpopo province, we work closely with LEDET, our provincial nature conservation authority, when we are trapping and wing tagging vulture nestlings. We weigh and measure and ring the birds, and if the nestlings are old enough, we also wing tag them. This little white-backed vulture on the right wasn't large enough to wing tag yet, so we just ringed it and put it back in its nest. Whatever the age of the vulture you're handling, it's best to let the bird's bill lean over the edge of your table or your tailgate of your vehicle. Vultures vomit when they get nervous, and you don't want to have to clean that up. Most of our field work happens in the dry winter months when vultures are breeding from April to October. When I say dry, I really do mean dry. This is one of our main study sites along the Blyder River and that ribbon of green trees marks the river. It's where hooded vultures nest. We do nest surveys each year, aerial surveys where possible, along with walking surveys along the rivers to find new nests. We monitor a sample of the nests we find at least three times during the breeding season to find out whether nests are occupied and whether nesting pairs are successful. At a sample of the vulture nests that we monitor, 
we install camera traps so we can remotely monitor breeding activity and see which predators might come to vulture nests. This involves using a rope and harness to safely access the canopies of tall trees. Climbing nest trees and doing nest checks along beautiful rivers are some of the best parts of my job. Under the leadership of my colleague Ronel Fisahi from the EWT, we also monitor hundreds of white-backed vulture nests in the Kalahari each year. And these vultures are tagged with the help of a fantastic team of volunteers from Prix de Fou in France and the Hawk Conservancy Trust in the UK. Sometimes after fitting birds with tracking units, our units stop transmitting data and then we know something is wrong, even, either with the tracking unit or with a bird. Either way, it's worth immediately looking for the bird at its last known location. Unfortunately, in this case, we didn't find our tracked hooded vulture or its transmitter in the Kruger National Park where it was last known to be. Instead, we found its ring, feathers and some bones. At least we knew that our bird was dead and where it had died. Once after another of our tracking units that was fitted to a hooded vulture stopped working, John and I drove to Zimbabwe over a weekend to look for the bird. We found the site, but there was no sign of our vulture and there was a deep layer of leaves on the ground, so we couldn't find our small tracking unit. We met this man, Tariro, who kept searching for our tracking unit after we had to return home to South Africa. Two weeks later, after many hours of searching, Tariro messaged me to say he'd found the unit and he'd managed to get it back to us. It was still working well and we were able to fit it to another hooded vulture that we trapped. In conjunction with many other partner organizations throughout Southern Africa, we are developing and implementing vulture safe zones to help conserve vultures. These are large tracts of land where we engage with landowners to remove the threats to vultures. And these threats can include drowning in farm reservoirs like this picture here, electrocutions, different kinds of poison, also lead poisoning and collisions. The first vulture safe zone that we're involved with is a project spearheaded by Dr. Gareth Tate. The zone covers more than 23,000 kilometers squared. We want to establish this central Karoo vulture safe zone to recover the Cape vultures that historically bred at key sites here. We're engaging with various stakeholders, including farmers, game breeders, private reserves and South African national parks to develop a landscape that will encourage Cape vultures back to areas of the Karoo from which they have vanished. This vulture safe zone encompasses three national parks as well as the Rupert Game Farm. The red stars show the locations of historical Cape vulture colonies. In between is a mixed landscape of agricultural farms, game breeding farms, hunting reserves and livestock farms. We will start small, working with individual landowners, parks and reserves to identify threats to vultures and then we will mitigate and remove those threats on each property. We will gradually include more and more properties. So now we reach the fourth section of my talk and I'd like to present you with some mind-blowing facts about vultures. I've chosen just five reasons why I think vultures are intriguing birds. Vultures are brave, they travel huge distances, they have phenomenal senses, they're great parents, and they are the best vertebrate scavengers. So first, vultures are brave. This is a picture from a camera trap at a hooded vulture nest in South Africa. This young hooded vulture had already learned to fly and left the nest but it would come back home for food sometimes for its parents to feed it at the nest. While it was away from the nest, an Egyptian goose came and laid eggs in the hooded vulture's nest. Now, Egyptian geese are known for being very aggressive, especially when they are breeding. They fight with other birds and have been seen other birds in fights. So when I saw that an Egyptian goose was using the hooded vulture's nest, I was a bit worried about what might happen. As you can see though, this young hooded vulture wasn't afraid of the goose. It would land in the tree when the goose was incubating. And when its parents came back to the nest to feed it, there would be fights between an adult vulture and the goose. 
The vultures didn't give up. They stayed and kept trying to push the goose out. And eventually the goose left, which I think was quite a success story for the small vulture family. Mind blowing fact number two, vultures are international travelers. To work out how far vultures travel, you can use a small tracking device like this one in this picture, which incidentally is the one that Torero found for us or under all those leaves in Zimbabwe. So you can take a tracking device like this and fit it to a vulture on a backpack harness. And the vulture in this picture is wearing one of these um, tracking devices. This map was created using tracking data from hooded vultures like the one shown here. 18 hooded vultures were trapped in Botswana, Mozambique and South Africa. Each colour on the map re represents the home range of a different bird. The single bird trapped in Mozambique was tagged for only a month and so its purple home range that you can see in the top right corner of the map there is really quite small compared to the other birds. The other birds were tracked for a year or more, and this gives us more than enough information for us to calculate their home range size. From a movement ecology study we recently published in collaboration with 16 other researchers from across Africa, we found that hooded vulture home range size differs dramatically depending on where the bird is from. The map on the left, the map of Africa, shows the range of the hooded vulture and the countries where birds were trapped. The other maps with the colours show hooded vulture monthly home ranges with different colours representing different individuals. Um, looking at the writing on the slide there, you can see that birds, hooded vultures from West Africa, from the Gambia, had really small monthly home range sizes of only 121 kilometres squared, which sounds big, but compared to other vulture home ranges from East and Southern Africa, it really was quite small. So East African birds had monthly home ranges of 3,735 kilometers squared. Birds here in Southern Africa had home ranges of over 12,000 kilometers squared. We also found that immature birds had larger home ranges than adult hooded vultures. And we believe this might be related to breeding. Um, adult hooded vultures visit the nests throughout the year, even when they're not breeding. So they seem to hang around the nests a bit and this probably constrains the movements a little, whereas immature birds don't have these constraints and they can wander and move around wherever they like. From this study, we found that eight months of tracking data is enough data if you want to just calculate a home range of a vulture for this species. So you don't need to have the tracking device on the bird for the rest of its life, which might be 20 years or more. You can make a device that just falls off as soon as possible after eight months. We also found that the northern subspecies of hooded vultures has smaller home ranges than the southern subspecies. So if we look at that map of Africa again on the left, and you can vaguely see two dotted line shapes, there's one around West Africa which is the northern subspecies. And there the birds are very commensal. They feed at dumps. They eat bits of food from people. They also eat human waste. Um, whereas birds from East and Southern Africa are far less commensal with people. They're found more in protected areas and have much more of a natural diet generally. And we think that this means their home range is much must be much larger because they need to go out and forage for food, whereas the West African birds can merely go to the nearest rubbish dump to find their food. So moving on to mind-blowing fact number three, vultures have amazing senses. As far as we know, African vultures mainly, use, mainly find their food using their incredible eyesight. They also use information transfer networks to find their food. This means that as they are soaring, they search the ground for food, but they also keep watching other vultures. And as soon as one vulture starts dropping towards the ground, towards the food, the other vultures will see that behavior and they'll follow. In the US, turkey vultures find food using their sense of smell too. They search for carrion by soaring over open ground or partly wooded areas where trees may obscure their view of the carrion and they partly rely on food, uh, on their sense of smell, sorry, to find their food. Mind-blowing fact number four, vultures are great parents. 
I spent a lot of time studying the breeding behavior of hooded vultures in northeastern South Africa. These birds lovingly line their nests with green leaves in preparation for the egg. Worryingly, we've occasionally seen some vultures adding man-made items to their nests, things like baling twine, pieces of plastic, and broken bits of tile, although luckily these cases seem to be the exception. This parent was clearly going for the minimalist approach with just one green leaf in its nest. And this is what a hooded vulture nest should look like, a beautifully arranged patchwork of green jackalberry leaves in this case. Once the chick hatches, the parents spend a lot of time with it. One thing that really impresses me about these birds is that on hot days, the parent bird will stand on the side of the nest with its back to the sun, intentionally casting a shadow over the chick. As the sun moves across the sky over the course of the day, the parent bird will shift its position accordingly so that its shadow always falls over the chick to keep it cool. Mind-blowing fact number five, vultures are the best scavengers. That's right, vultures are better scavengers than jackals, lions, hyenas and leopards. This lady, Dr. Darcy Ogada and her colleagues did some experiments in Kenya. These researchers compared the scavenging abilities of vultures, which are obligate scavengers, in other words, they generally only scavenge, with mammalian species that are facultative scavengers. In other words, they can hunt as well as scavenge, so these mammals aren't as well specialized for scavenging. Darcy and her colleagues found that if vultures were excluded from accessing carcasses, then carcasses took longer to decompose, the number of mammals at carcasses increased, and the time that mammals spent at carcasses also increased. And interestingly, all three of these negative effects increased about threefold in the absence of vultures. This means that if we lose our vultures from the ecosystem, then carcasses will be in the environment for longer, possibly as a breeding ground for pathogens or germs. There will be more interactions between mammals at carcasses, and so increased chances of a sick individual transmitting a disease to another animal. All of this is bad news for people and our environment, so we need to conserve vultures if we want our ecosystems to stay healthy. So now we reach the last section of this presentation. What can we do to help vultures? Something we can all do to help vultures is to tell people about the threats that vultures face and educate people about what interesting and important birds vultures are. These pictures were taken at one of our school visits last year. This is Walter, our taxidermied white-backed vulture, showing the learners what a huge wingspan vultures have. And there is my colleague, John Davies, doing a tree climbing demonstration to show the learners how we access vulture nests to set up camera traps. So increasing our environmental awareness about vultures is one way we can help these birds. Something else we can do is to reduce the threat of lead poisoning by switching from using leaded ammunition to using non-lead alternatives, such as these brands which are already available in South Africa. Using non-lead ammunition will help to protect carnivores and scavengers from lead poisoning that can result from consuming animals shot with lead ammunition. There are already hunters and nature reserves, such as Timbavati Private Nature Reserve in South Africa who have made the switch to non-lead ammunition. And in the UK, certain grocery stores have begun phasing out the use of lead shot for the game meat they sell. As consumers, we can choose not to eat meat from animals that were killed using lead ammunition. Vultures are long-lived birds, and if we want them to avoid carcasses contaminated with lead fragments for the whole of their long lives, we need to make sure that no carcasses contain lead from ammunition. The use of lead ammunition is one of the threats to vultures that we can and should control, for the sake of our vultures and other scavengers, and for human health reasons as well. Something else we can do is to report wing-tagged vultures. Each year, the Endangered Wildlife Trust <clears throat> and teams from other organizations fit wing tags to vultures at various sites across South Africa. 
This form of marking helps us to track vultures' movements in a relatively economical way. We trap adult vultures on the ground and we also tag large vulture nestlings before they leave the nest. Wing tagging is particularly effective if it's done in an area with lots of people, such as the low felt area of South Africa, where tourists visiting the Kruger National Park and surrounding private nature reserves are actively watching wildlife and taking photos of the birds they see. Our wing tagging program can only be successful with the help of people who notice the wing tags and report them to us. So if you are visiting a national park, such as the Kruger, please keep your eyes peeled for wing tags. Take a picture if you can and send us the location, date and wing tag number. We can then give you a history of when and where the bird was tagged and where it has been seen to date. This heat map was created by Dr. Gareth Tate using data from the EWT's Vulture Resightings database and it shows where wing tag vultures have been seen. We can clearly see five of the main vulture tagging sites in southern Africa. Namibia, the Mahalisburg, the Makala Dranfield site, Zululand, where Wildlife Act and the Ezemvelo Kesed and Wildlife teams work, and the Kruger Bofeld region, where the Endangered Wildlife Trust and Ledet do a lot of wing tagging. This map shows the resightings of our A series wing tags, which are fitted to birds in the low felt. From this map, we can see that birds tagged in the low felt have traveled all the way to northern Namibia and northern Zimbabwe. Our wing tagging work takes us to some beautiful areas and it's a privilege to be able to see the world from a vulture's viewpoint. So I'd like to wrap it up there and I want to thank all of our funders and partners including Poi de Fou, the K2C Biosphere Region, the Disney Conservation Fund, the Charles Fonda Mahava Trust, the EWT ESCOM Strategic Partnership, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, Rand Merchant Bank, and the Hawk Conservancy Trust. I'd also like to thank all of you for joining me. If you'd like to get in touch, you can email me using this email address. Now we'll have a few minutes for me to answer questions that people have typed into the Q&A box. Okay, so Rhiannon Gill, thank you for your question, asks, um, have you had any instances where you removed a chick from its nest to weigh it and tag it, placed it back, and then it's been rejected by its parents? Thanks for the question. Um, no, we haven't, luckily. Um, before I started working with birds, I'd heard some stories about you shouldn't touch small birds because your smell will be on the bird and its parents will reject it, but that I think that's just a myth. Um, we've handled many, many birds, many species, and we've never had a parent rejecting it. Obviously, we'd want to be as quick as we possibly can, be quiet. If we have to talk whisper, to just provide as limited disturbance as possible. But we've never, we, whenever we go back and check, um, the parents are there, the birds there, the parents come back as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, so no, it's never been a problem. Um, Megan Antrobus, thank you for your question, says, good morning. What would be the factors that would have an effect on the home range sizes? Why would the northern individuals have a smaller home range size? Good question. Um, so yeah, so this is back to the hooded vultures. Um, we had birds from the Gambia trapped and tagged, and then we had birds from Kenya um, tagged as well, so East Africa, and then we had birds from Southern Africa, so Mozambique, Botswana, and South Africa. So we had these northern and southern population individuals from these populations tagged. And as I mentioned before, hooded vultures are commensal, which means they have a relationship with people and rely on people for food sometimes. And it seems to vary to different degrees throughout their range. Um, so in southern Africa, our populations don't seem to be commensal really. Yes, they'll eat at vulture restaurants sometimes, but mostly they're relying on food they find themselves. And because carrion is not predictable in the bush felt, um, you have to really search, you have to travel far and wide to find carrion. You don't know when it's going to occur or where. So you have to look 
over a really wide range. So that's why our Southern African birds have really large home range sizes. Whereas in Western Africa, the birds feed at rubbish dumps. So apparently they walk between your legs in markets and pick up the chicken drumstick that a person just dropped. Um, <laughs> no shame. So they eat all sorts of things like that. And they don't need a big home range. If they know where their food's coming from, they can just go straight to the market and get some food. So they don't need to travel far at all. Um, so Karin Rapani says, hi, do you reintroduce vultures in some reserves? Um, is there a way to educate populations, even children, to stop persecuting them? They are so majestic animals and precious. I agree, absolutely, they are majestic and they are precious. Um, we do some education work um, with kids. Um, kids seem to be remarkably smart and aware. Um, they ask all sorts of difficult <laughs> questions, like why vultures circle around the sun. I had that question a lot, and then I realized that the children went thermaling. Why do they thermal? So they're definitely aware, those people who live in areas where vultures are. Um, I think the challenge is traditional beliefs in some cases where vultures are very widely used throughout Africa and a lot of cultures, their body parts. And these are really strong beliefs. So it's difficult. A person can't just go into these cultures that believe in the magical abilities of vultures, can't go in and say this is wrong. It's like trying to change someone's religion. It's just not going to work. So we need to get creative and think about ways to do that. Um, and then your other part of your question was, do you reintroduce vultures to some reserves? Um, we don't at the moment, but there is in South Africa, there's a, and Lesotho as well, the two countries combined, there's a breeding program for bearded vultures, um, which is going slow, more slowly than anticipated, but um, they do have a small population at the moment. So hopefully over the next few years, as that gets larger, then those birds will be reintroduced um, in the Drakensberg Mountains. Um, Ali, hello Jan, nice to see you. Um, any of our South African vultures migrate out of Africa to Asia? They do. Um, generally our vultures don't, I wouldn't say they migrate, it depends which definition of migrate you mean, um, but I, if it's a seasonal migration, not really, but except for the Egyptian vulture. So the Egyptian vulture does migrate. Jimmy Hill says, is anyone carrying out any studies into the cultural beliefs and value of vultures? Thanks to your question, Jimmy. Yes, absolutely. There's already been um, a handful of really good studies <coughs> um, by Viv Williams and Steve McKean and others um, on the cultural value of vultures, their use in the trade for traditional medicine. And it's given as an insight into why people use these birds and how much they use them. Um, there's also a master's student who's just finished her master's study looking at um, traditional beliefs in this low felt area where I work. So I'm really excited for her work to be published as well. Um, yeah, it just helps us understand who's using the birds and what for. Um, let's go up a little bit. Ian says, why aren't the laws enforced by authorities at the Muti markets? Brilliant question. Um, I haven't really been to these Muti markets myself. Um, it's difficult because I think people know it's illegal to trade an endangered species. Um, so it's a risk to yourself if you're trying to enforce laws. Um, we do have fantastic environmental laws in South Africa, but enforcement I would say seems to be a problem across the board. <laughs> um, people are trying and there are arrests going on, but I think we can do better on the enforcement front. Um, Miranda Thorpe, thanks for your question. She asks, are cases of poisonings investigated? Who investigates and have people been prosecuted for poisoning vultures? Thanks for this question, it's a really good one. Um, yes, cases of poisonings are investigated. It would be the police and the stock theft unit um, and others who investigate. Um, samples need to be taken and sent to the lab for analysis to confirm what kind of poison it is. Um, have people been prosecuted for, for poisoning vultures? Yes, they have. Unfortunately, not as many as we would like. It's a small percentage, I think, of the poisonings that go on, but some people have um, been prosecuted and fines have been issued. Um, unfortunately, these fines are also really small. And looking at those studies I spoke about earlier that shows how incredibly valuable vultures are, these fines 
are just ridiculous. Um, I think the amounts need to be a lot bigger to be much more prohibitive. Um, let's see. So Wern Co, thanks for your question. I'm not sure if I know, said your name right. Varen Co, how does the EWT involve local communities in vulture conservation? Um, thanks for this question. We do try to involve local communities as much as possible. Um, it brings money into the community and it brings skills for local people. And it also teaches us at the EWC a lot and provides us with manpower that's really good. Um, I would say in our area, we try and involve the environmental monitors um, who are employed by sand parks through the K2C Biosphere Reserve. Um, we are going to be hopefully working with them a lot more this year as we start our vulture safe zone in the low felt. Um, so yeah, we do try and involve local communities. Um, Mel Tripp says, is there any pressure on governments to ban lead phase it out by law? Um, yes, I think the South Africa, the South Africa, South Africa has agreed um, on paper to phase out lead. So we are committed as a country and we do have a national lead task team which is looking at how to do this. Um, the hunting bodies are on board and working with us and it's a really great partnership actually. Um, diplomatic discussions and I think we are moving things forward. It will be slow. Um, as always there'll be people who are happy to try and change and there'll be people who are very set in their ways and I understand both sides of view, but I think if we keep open minds, work together, um, we can we can make this change eventually. Um, Athena asks, are hand-reared vultures successfully released and do they survive? I am not sure about this. I'm really sorry. I'll have to find out. If you can email me, I'll find out for you. I know that Shannon Hoffman at the Birds of the Prey Sanctuary, she's the manager of the Bearded Vulture Recovery Program, breeding program, um, and she's hand rearing bearded vulture chicks at the moment. Um, obviously, birds reared by their parents is far, far preferable, um, but we'll have to see. Um, something we would like to do is to put tracking devices on birds that are released. Um, I think this will help us to understand much more about this. Um, so Erin Rawlinson says, why can vultures consume various sick bacteria meat um, but are so vulnerable and die of poison? What type of poison do people use that's killing them? Thanks Erin for your question. Um, good point. It is a bit confusing. I understand your question. Um, how can vultures eat things like anthrax spores and be just fine? Um, so this is to do with their amazing um, gastric juices that are very, very acidic and they can kill a lot of pathogens. Things that would make us sick to pathogens is just fine. To vultures is just fine. They can cope with it. Um, what kinds of poisons are used? Mostly it's um, pesticides, insecticides, things like two-step, cover mate poisoning, organophosphates. So it's mostly insecticides that should be used on plants. You should spray it on plants to stop insects coming and eating your plants but these are used in the wrong way. They're used to poison wildlife. They can also kill people. Um, and unfortunately, even though some of them are illegal to sell, you can buy them quite freely in markets. Um, why do they kill the vultures? I'm not sure about all the physiology. I'll have to look into that. But they cause a whole range of physiological symptoms. Um, yeah, it's really, really horrible to see a poisoned vulture. Um, Michelle Watson says, I seem to remember there being an antibiotic used in livestock that's detrimental to vultures. You can't recall the facts. Is this something that's a problem for vultures today? This is a great question. Um, yes, this antibiotic, I think you're referring to, um, oh gosh, I've just forgotten the name, this um, diclofenac. So this is a drug, it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. It's a veterinary drug. Um, that you give to cattle if they're inflamed or if they're in pain. Um, and it, it's fine in the cattle, but if the cow dies, then it's toxic to the vultures. It causes renal failure. And this drug it what is what has caused um, the Asian vulture crisis in the 1990s, where over 90% of three vulture species 
just declined so quickly. Um, yes, it is still a problem today. Um, certain countries in Europe, it's still legal to use it, which is horrifying. Um, it has been banned in other countries in Asia, which is great. Although I believe it is still used, it can be sold in small vials for human consumption. And I think people just add m lots of those vials together and give it to cattle, which is sad. Um, it's sold in South Africa. I've seen it in the pharmacy near me. It's for people, um, not veterinary consumption. So luckily it's not much of an issue that we know of in South Africa, but it is on our radar and we do keep an eye on this. Um, Robbie Mann, hi, thanks for your question. He says, what are the prospects of the government helping in potentially banning lead bullets? Um, we are working at the go with the government, with the Department of Environment, Environmental Affairs. Um, we do have meetings with them a few times a year, along with other NGOs and other interested parties. And we are working towards reducing lead ammunition, along with other sources of lead that can affect wildlife. Um, yeah, this is something that we are working towards and South Africa has already committed to doing. Uh, Michelle asks, which tracking devices have you found to be the most reliable? Um, I haven't used enough or enough different kinds or enough samples from each different kind to want to make a public statement about what's the most reliable. Um, I know that prices are coming down quickly, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, so maybe email me and I can try and give you more information. Um, Ali, yes, says diclofenac is not an antibiotic, it's NSAID. Absolutely, thank you for that. Just to clarify, diclofenac, which is that drug I mentioned before that was involved in the Asian vulture crisis, is an NSAID, so it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Right, and I think we've come to the end of our time. Um, if I haven't answered your question, please email me, please get in touch, I'd love to chat to you. Um, thanks so much, everyone.